But Phil only took LSD twice. And both times, I gave it to him. And the first time, he had quite a good experience. The second time, he had a very bad experience in which he thought he was a gladiator in ancient Rome. And what happened to Phil was that even though he had never studied Latin, and I studied Latin in high school, so I could understand Latin, but he began speaking Latin when he was that gladiator. He was speaking good Latin, grammatically correct, but easy going, as if he'd spoken it as a native tongue. And that was spooky. In November of 71, he said my house was hit, and he thinks it was the FBI that broke in and trashed his house. And so he fled to Canada, living in Vancouver, where he made, unfortunately, his first suicide attempt. Phil Dick had um, gone to Vancouver in Canada in order to be guest of honor for a convention. And then when the convention ended, he just didn't come home. Later, I found out, of course, that he um, had attempted suicide in Canada. And in order to sort of be living in a secure and monitored environment had checked himself into a place called Ex Calais, which was in fact a heroin rehab uh, compound. He said that's where the book the Scanner Darkly, well, you got the idea for it back then. Um, the idea of drugs, you know, came from that. And in fact, they did seem to have done him some good. Uh, the sort of closely monitored, uh, very, very intensive care uh, does seem to have been what he needed. And he eventually, in effect, outgrew the need for it, uh, recovered, and was ready to sort of step back into civilization again. Now and then a dealer, realizing he was about to be busted, took refuge in one of the drug rehabilitation places, like Synanon and Centerpoint and Ex-Calais and New Path posing as an addict seeking help. Once inside, his wallet, his name, everything that identified him was stripped away in preparation for building up a new personality not drug-oriented. Then, later on, when the pressure was off, the dealer emerged and resumed his usual activity outside. I only got partial details about how Phil wound up uh, down in Orange County. Uh, Phil had wanted to get out of that drug rehab uh, place up in Canada and uh, Willis, you know, helped make it possible. When Vancouver stopped being uh, feasible as a new place to live, he wrote to a professor at Cal State Fullerton and said, I have nowhere to live. Uh, my home back in California has been blown up. Um, I'm virtually homeless. And the professor uh, read Phil's letter to the class, and a couple of the students said, we just lost a roommate. Uh, we, we could use another roommate. And they said, would you like to come to the airport to pick up Philip K. Dick? And I said, yes, of course. You know, when I first met him, he was very, you know, he was, you know, uh, very friendly, very warm. Uh, very enthusiastic. He had, a, he had an incredible, enthusiastic, uh, bubbling uh, personality. And I believe Tim was one of, uh, Tim Powers was one of Willis McNally's uh, students who actually uh, met Phil at the airport. Well, when he stepped through the gate, we were waiting for him in the gate area of the airport there. Uh, he looked desperate. He uh, was wearing a sport coat that was too short for him and too short in the shoulders. His luggage was held together with an electrical extension cord and he was carrying a copy of the Bible which later he said was to mollify customs. And of course his old life in the Bay Area was really no longer an option since his marriage had broken up. His house had been melodramatically uh, broken into and robbed. Uh, and even the police had, I believe, implied that they thought it would be a good idea if he went away and never came back. Before I met Phil, I was simply trying to escape from my dysfunctional family. 
I was trying to decide whether to go to college or join the Navy. And I had no plans to get married or have children. <laughs> but I went to this 4th of July party with uh, people. And when I saw Phil, I just instantly fell in love with him. And we started talking. And we basically never separated after that until several years later when our marriage fell apart. In 1973, Christopher Kenneth Dick is born. Gradually, Dick returns to his writing and in a letter to a friend, describes his marriage to Tessa. He writes, we are living in a Philip K. Dick novel. Only a few months later, in February of 1974, fiction would become fact. Because Phil didn't like to drive, he started having the pharmacy deliver his prescriptions. He had had uh, dental surgery and he was in a lot of pain. And when the woman came to deliver his, his pain medication from the drugstore, the light flashed off her Christian fish symbol that she was wearing. And when Phil saw that little gold necklace, it caught the light, probably sunlight. And he was hit between the eyes with a beam of light, only with no ordinary beam of light. It was, I don't know, a penetrating ray of some kind, although it did not hurt him. And he saw this as a pink beam that uh, initiated a, a fairly long period, several weeks at least, of what he mostly concluded, most often thought, was uh, a contact with God. And during this vision, he was given a, um, a knowledge that his infant son, Christopher, had a very serious hernia and could die from it if the doctors did not treat it. What happened in real life was that I noticed a problem when I was changing his diapers, so I took him to the doctor, and the doctor told me that I was not cleaning him well enough between diaper changes. And I knew that wasn't it, but about a month later, Phil had a vision while napping, and he came out to the living room and told me exactly what was wrong with Christopher. And I called up the doctor and made another appointment, and Phil was right, and I was right. The doctor did indeed find a very severe inguinal hernia that could have been fatal had it not been treated, and the baby had immediate surgery. This exact diagnosis of Christopher's illness causes some witnesses to believe that Philip K. Dick could have acquired information from outside his normal consciousness. Encouraged by these recurring visions, he now believes that reality is a projection that hides or conceals the ultimate truth. This theme is constant throughout his novels, but now in his real life, he believes this to be true. In late February of 1974, I was given sodium pentothal for the extraction of impacted wisdom teeth. Later that day, back home again, but still deeply under the influence of the sodium pentothal, I had a short, acute flash of recovered memory. Then in mid-March, month later, the total body of memories intact and entire began to return. You are free to believe me or to disbelieve, but please take my word on it that I am not joking. This is very serious, a matter of importance. For the rest of his life after that, uh, the main concern of all his research was, was that God? If not, what else might it have been? Uh, and it resulted in some, of course, tremendous books. Uh, mainly, I think, Vallis was uh, probably the most significant result of, of that experience. The things that he talked about at the time, I mean, yeah, there was uh, this theory he came up with about uh, the, the Vallis entity. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a theory, that his mystical experiences had been somehow a result of an encounter with this, with this Vallis thing. <laughs> 